So I'm delighted to be able to be chairing this um, today, Connecting the Dots, Integrating Research Outputs Beyond the PDF. We've got three great speakers uh, lined up who are actually uh, either researching this or trying to put it into practice. Um, and I'm not going to introduce them because they are in uh, uh, the bios you've got access to. Um, but this is really also uh, about thinking what the role of publishers in particular, uh, or what the roles of publishers are in helping to support the adoption of open science and help to uh, make it easier for authors to practice open science and to use the skills and expertise they have in different ways to perhaps provide services around uh, open science. Um, um, <clears throat> So with that said in mind, we're going to have uh, three talks. Um, uh, Stephen's going to really provide a broad overview and framing for this within the context of peer review. Um, Aracha is going to look very specifically at uh, both peer review uh, in relation to preprinting. And Ian's going to uh, 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 focus on uh, not just data, but mostly data. And, and look at a more uh, at the sort of system system wide, and in fact, uh, Stephen's got a more epistemological approach, um, and then we go down to specific examples, and then come back to a more systemic approach. So, with that in mind, um, I'm going to just hand over. We've got three short presentations. Then we're going to have question and answers from the audience. We're not going to use the app because people are having difficulty, and I want to. Uh, uh, I hope this is provocative. And I want the audience to really try and engage about what the challenges are, uh, what you're really thinking about whether you can do this, and whether you as publishers uh, uh, and others can start to implement these types of actions and practices uh, within your publishing organization. So, Stephen, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Katrina, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'd like to talk about the uh, role of peer review in connecting the dots. Um, and I'm going to wait for my presentation to come up because I need to run through it fairly quickly. I'd like to talk about uh, peer review in it and its possible role in connecting the dots. And I ought to say to begin with that the... It's not advancing. There we go. I have to say to begin with that uh, much of what I want to say stems from work I've been carrying out with colleagues in the Research on Research Institute, and I'd like to pay tribute uh, to them. Much of the work we've been doing has been looking at innovation in the peer review space, and so I'm going to be mentioning some of those innovations uh, that we've featured in our research as I go along. We traditionally associate peer review with journal articles, of course, which occur towards the end of the research process, uh, illustrated by this schematic. But increasingly, we're seeing other kinds of research objects or research artifacts being made public in different ways at the different stages of the research process. And so the question arises, to what extent can peer review be a kind of epistemic glue between these different dots to connect them up. Many of them are made available to improve robustness or transparency or reproducibility. And so it's obvious that they might be associated with some kind of quality control or peer review. So the question is, what, what does that actually uh, look like? So to so what extent should peer review be associated with these different objects and how does the, the different peer review moments uh, relate to each other? What does that mean for the different actors involved? And particularly, what does it mean for publishers and other scholarly communication service providers? That's the overarching question. An initial question that arises from that is, the, is that of criteria. Now, we're very used to different criteria being associated with innovation in the peer review space. Soundness only peer review has been with us for a number of years now and is an example of innovation in that space. But there may be other kinds of innovations as well, may be associated with specialist peer review, such as uh, statistical peer review and so on. But what does that mean for these other outputs and how peer review should be approached or for these other outputs? Taking preprints as an example, a number of services have arisen, particularly in the last five years, 
which are peer reviewing preprints. So should that peer review process be similar to that of journal articles or somehow different? It, should it be lighter touch, for example? And how can that peer review process be linked to the, the, the journal peer review process in order to create arguably uh, efficiency? So those are the kinds of questions that arise in relation to criteria. But this leads to questions of roles. What are the roles of the different actors in the scholarly communication process in relation to this peer review join up? Publishers are traditionally associated with quite a narrow space within the research process associated with journal articles. But if they uh, uh, are extending their roles, maybe their jurisdiction should be extended across other parts of the research process to take into account uh, management of peer review of these different artifacts. Um, of course, these are not the only objects that are peer reviewed in the research process, but many other parts of the peer review process are managed by other actors. So funders manage peer review of funding proposals, government and other agencies manage peer review of impact case studies and similar sorts of impact um, uh, accounts. So the question arises then, what's the relationship between these actors and publishers in relation uh, to peer review? And should potentially these other actors extend their jurisdictions into other parts of the research process? And what does that mean for the relationship uh, with, with publishers? What does it mean, for example, uh, about the possible join up between these different peer review uh, processes? As an example, um, uh, there is an ostensible uh, uh, connection between a funding proposal on the one hand and a protocol or a registered report on another. Both are talking about the research design and yet at the moment they're kind of hermetically sealed from each other in terms of the peer review process. Should there be some kind of connection between these different uh, peer review processes and how would that work? Of course, the connector between all of these peer review processes is researchers. They carry out the peer review, even if it's managed by different uh, agents. And this raises a number of questions about the role of, of researchers in this, whole, uh, in this whole space. Now, many of these additional peer review processes that I've been talking about are put forward to advance uh, reproducibility or transparency or quality, but this then creates a potential tension with that of burden. In an already overburdened system, by putting forward new forms of peer review, are we increasing the burden to a, to a point that it's unrealistic? So that's an important question where quality, on the one hand, may be in tension with the question of burden uh, on the other. But there are other questions that need to be addressed in this whole uh, space as well. And one is to do with the level of openness and transparency. Um, it's increasingly proposed, for example, that layered on top of the research outputs we've been talking about, peer review reports can usefully be added to the available uh, research record, looking at the exchanges between peer reviewers and uh, uh, the, the creators of the artifacts could in itself be a valuable contribution to the scholarly communication um, record. That's where openness and transparency could be a very valuable thing. But at the same time, we have cross currents which are pushing for anonymity in the uh, peer review space to eliminate bias, for example. But that creates a tension where basically, if you realistically wanted double blind peer review journal articles, you can't have many of these other artifacts available because it means that they can't be double blinded. If you've got a preprint available, and that is linked to a particular author, then a double blind peer review uh, process is unrealistic. So in question, how is, that, how is that tension being managed when we're seeing some, some publishers going back towards double blind and others emphasizing uh, transparency? Those are the kinds of questions that I think need to be managed. Now, we published um, a paper recently looking at these different innovations that we've uh, identified within the uh, publisher community uh, on peer review. And we developed a taxonomy of, of peer review that we helped us to carry out that analysis. But we also 
um, put forward this model of the four schools of peer review, as, as we've called it, which attempts to tease out some of these complementarities, as well as tensions between the quality and reproducibility driver versus the efficiency and streamlining driver, for example, or the democracy and trans transparency driver versus the equity and inclusion driver. And there are tensions between them, uh, which we're trying to um, uh, trying to identify, but also engage in conversation about how they might be uh, resolved. Um, we published a paper on, our, on innovations. This four schools paper, we published a, a, an LSE impact blog about. It's available as a preprint, but it's currently under peer review. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Katrina, and to the organizers for the opportunity to be here and delighted to see all of you in person after uh, the pandemic period. Um, right, so I'm Irache from ASAP Bio, uh, and I guess something I can do while I wait for the slides is to uh, briefly introduce ASAP Bio for any of you who may not be familiar. We are a nonprofit with a mission to make life sciences communication uh, faster and more transparent. So I'm here to speak about one of us a specific initiatives called Publish Your Reviews that we see as a tool to increase transparency in the review process, but also looking at individual reviewers as a way to give them more agency, more control as to what to do with the reviews. Um, right, so what's Publish Your Reviews is an initiative where we are inviting peer reviewers uh, to take the uh, reviews that they are completing for journals for submissions that are under review for, for journal publication, and to take that reviews and post them on the preprint copy of the paper, wherever there is a, a preprint for that paper. So why do we care about this? Why do we think that there is value in opening up those reviews and specifically posting them with the preprints? There is uh, a lot of value in giving that further context for preprinted research. As you know, preprints are posted without going through peer review at the server. So this is a way of adding further context for both specialized and non-specialized readers, point out the strengths, but also whenever there are questions or limitations about that work. It's also a good way by virtue of the fact that the reviews are public to enable the reuse of those peer reviews. Um, Stephen already referred to the, to the fact that it's uh, quite a bit of burden in the system. So this is a potential way to allow the reuse of those public reviews that are already available on the preprint if the manuscript that was uh, reviewed for the journal is rejected that can potentially be reduced at another stage of the life cycle for that paper. And then importantly, at ASAP Bio, we believe that there is, uh, we should support transparency in review, and in particular, we believe in encouraging this cultural shift into having more open discourse and engagement publicly around preprints about different research outputs. Right, so we are encouraging uh, reviewers to do this. We think that it's a great way of uh, enabling reviewer agency in different ways by sharing the reviews on preprints. Um, for starters, it's a way for reviewers to make their own choices as to whether they want to make the reviews uh, transparent, independent on whether the journal already runs transparent or open peer review. They can just post the review publicly themselves. This also allows the, uh, uh, the review to be public. Um, the reviewer can then signal that as a, as a review that they have completed is there a scholarship and hopefully what we want to do is by more and more of these reviews being public to also support greater recognition for peer review activities as a whole, which we know that it's a very important community service, critical for journal publication and not very much valued at the moment. And then importantly, we also uh, think there is a great value in this uh, transparency in reviews on the preprint because what we encourage is the posting of the comments in the preprint that are, uh, sorry, the comments on, from the review that are specific to the scientific content. So essentially we understand that there is an important gatekeeping process uh, that happens at the journals in terms of making the editorial decision to publish or not. But we also see value in having that review of the science for the science that is attached to the preprinted research. So what does this mean for reviewers? We ask uh, reviewers to sign a pledge, which is available on our website. We ask them that they commit to making those uh, journal reviews publicly available alongside uh, preprints. And one thing I want to uh, nuance is that we do 
provide guidance, advice in reviewers that they should not include anything in the public review that may uh, jeopardize the confidentiality of the review process or the journal name or any other information that may give away where the, where, where the paper is being reviewed. And something I wanted to also nuance is the fact that the, there is possibilities to publish the reviews in different platforms. They don't need to be signed. There are different ways of publishing reviews with preprints in an anonymous manner as well. So what does this uh, look like uh, in terms of the actual review? This is an example uh, of a paper that was undergoing peer review, had been posted as a preprint uh, uh, several months ago. The um, reviewers were invited to review. They posted their comments um, on BioArchive alongside the preprint, so that made the review also uh, transparent, but immediately available with the preprint, and then they submitted that link to the uh, journal so that they could reuse that review as part of the review process. It's, it was published in a journal that also has transparent reviews. The review is also available with the journal version of record. Where are we now with the campaign? We launched this in July. We have a number of supporting organizations that we are uh, very grateful for, for their endorsement. We have several journals and publishers involved, as well as other organizations, including funders, uh, preprint servers, uh, preprint review platforms. And in terms of reviewers, we have now over 70 signatories uh, on the side of individual reviewers. Right, so I guess before I close my part, I just want to do a call for anyone in the audience who may be interested in learning more about this. You can um, uh, get your journal to b become a supporter if they are not already supporting this initiative. We are very happy to, again, provide more information or encourage you to join. It's, uh, um, you can also, in addition to just endorsing the initiative, promote it and encourage your own reviewers to post the reviews publicly and also potentially look into what posted uh, reviews are already available on preprints that you may have under consideration to again allow that reuse of those uh, review reports. And then looking ahead, I would hope, again, maybe we will discuss that um, in the next section. I would hope that with greater uh, adoption of this transparency of uh, reviews and particularly of uh, reviews on preprints, we will hopefully increase the visibility of reviews. We will uh, encourage mechanisms to bring, uh, make these reviews more discoverable. I know that several journals already submit their reviews to ORCID. It would be interesting to also have preprint reviews added to the ORCID records for those reviewers to give them credit for that activity. But also more broadly, I think this is another way where we can push for further recognition for peer review activities and preprint review in particular as part of different research assessment uh, frameworks. And with that, you have more information on our website. Thank you for listening and look forward to the discussion. everyone. Um, my slides should appear soon. Um, meanwhile, first time talking in public in three years. A little bit anxious, so bear with me. Um, okay, so um, next slide, this one. Um, so when we're talking about these dots, these outputs beyond the PDF, what I think we're actually talking about is open science practices. And at POS, we've actually identified 14 different open science practices that our journal supports. Um, right now, we're focused on four of these on this slide, um, where we're trying to find ways to increase adoption of these practices. And for this talk, because we've already heard a lot about, heard a lot about preprints, I'm going to talk about three of these. Protocols, code, and research data. Um, but why are we focused on these practices? Um, well, an important reason is researcher needs. You know, what problems are we going to solve by increasing adoption of these practices? And we know from research that we've done at PLOS over the last couple of years that reuse of research data and reuse of code is important to a lot of researchers, but they are not happy with their ability to get hold of that data and code on average. And so when researchers have tasks they need to get done to do their research that they can't complete effectively, then it probably means there's an opportunity for somebody to provide them with better solutions to get those things done. And for methods, for protocols, and when I say protocol, I mean a detailed step-by-step -step method 
more common probably in the life sciences, but, but also used elsewhere. Some research that we've just done that we haven't shared yet, but it will be shared soon, um, we asked a thousand researchers many things about methods sharing and publishing, um, but one key insight was that the methods section of an article is, it's fine if you want to evaluate the findings of a study, but if you want to reproduce results, if you want to reuse or extend research, then the traditional methods section is not doing a good enough job at helping researchers complete that task. So those are the problems. What are the potential solutions? And when I say solution, um, I take a very, very broad view of what that is. Um, it could be a policy, it could be something technological, it could be a partner we work with, it could be a workflow or a, or a customer experience. It's really anything that helps achieve that goal of making these outputs more visible. So what have we tried and what impact have those things had? Um, well, something that we implemented a few years ago at PLOS is a strong data sharing policy for everyone who publishes in PLOS journals. And a correlation, um, one could argue, between that strong policy and strongly encouraging authors to follow best practice in sharing those outputs, i.e. using data repositories, is we're seeing year on year steady increase in that best practice. So now 30 1% of authors share data in a repository, and we want to see more of that happening. Um, something that we've just more recently been experimenting with um, just this year, this is a live experiment. We're trying to accelerate that increase in best practice. How can we get more research data into repositories, which makes it more findable and connectable and all of those good things? So this, um, this experiment that we're running is to deploy on certain articles a feature that's a bit like a badge or a link, but it has two purposes. One is to enable readers to get access to the data, because that's one of the problems that we want to solve, but also it's to provide some kind of visual reward or incentive um, for actually exhibiting that practice in the first place. So we may have come across badges for open practices, so there's certainly an element of that, but importantly, it's actually giving access to the, to the data as well. So there are, there are two goals with this experiment. One. The four things on here, actually, the first two are goals. The second, the more about how we're doing it. But um, the first goal is to increase use of the data. So we're seeing if, um, if, if that happens. And also, do more researchers actually share data in that way? A um, couple of key things about how this works is that it's fully automated. So there's no extra work for authors, no extra work for editors, no extra work for reviewers. This feature deploys automatically based on rules um, and the content of the article. Um, this is a live experiment. I don't have meaningful results to share yet, but there's, because this is only on a, a small subset of articles as an experiment, about just under 3,000, there have been around 7,000 clicks of the feature so far, um, with up to 57 on one paper. So I can't give you much context, but certainly people do seem to be engaging so far. Um, for the method sharing problem, there's lots of things you could do. One thing that we're doing is offering um, a new article type, a new product in a way, to give researchers the best of both worlds. So to provide the peer review, the indexing, the credit that comes with a journal article. But this journal article, which we've called a lab protocol, doesn't really have a method section. The method section actually lives on a platform that's much better at hosting lots of detailed step-by-step -step information, and that platform is protocols.io. Um, but depending on where you are as a publisher, there might actually be quite simple solutions to how you can make methods more reusable. And that could be simply just removing length restrictions on your, on your methods section, which unfortunately is still a barrier for some. Final example uh, to mention. So this is another policy-based solution. Um, so something that we worked with the editors of one of our journals to do over the last couple of years, um, the journal's PLOS Computational Biology, um, was to design, test, revise, implement a policy that made code sharing mandatory for everyone in this journal. And we wanted to analyze the impact of that policy. And what we found um, a year after the impact of the policy is that, well, code sharing rates have been going up in the journal since 2019, but after the policy was introduced, that rate has accelerated. Um, and we work with an organization called Dataseer in order to, to analyze thousands of articles programmatically um, so that this could be done at scale. And sort of leading on really to my final point in that 
this getting better at actually understanding these practices and measuring them is, is really super important. You know, if we want to take an evidence-based approach to removing barriers to adoption of open science, then we really need to understand, we really need to measure. You know, the old saying goes, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it or you can't manage it. Um, so I think this is super important. And to that end, we've actually just started doing this assessment of various open science practices at scale across the entire PLOS corpus. So we're going to be calculating all of uh, the, the, the rates of these various good practices in open science. So uh, how, what proportion of papers share data and repositories, what proportion share code, how many post preprints, and, and eventually how many post protocols as well. And we're doing that um, because it helps us understand researchers better, it helps us find ways to support them better, it helps us understand the impact of what we're doing, which is, which is a point I've tried to emphasize. But we're also going to publish all of this data as well, because we do know that there are lots of other people out there who are, need good, reliable information to make decisions that, that help make open science practices the norms. So this will be available for everyone, including all publishers as well. Um, and with that good information, with that data, I certainly think it gives more, us more opportunities to make connections and join those dots. Thank you. very much. Uh, I think those are uh, three very provocative talks. Um, and in, in one sense, what we're hearing uh, today in relation to uh, open science, and this is what we're, we're talking about, how do, we, how do we actually support the adoption of open science practices for researchers? The, uh, it's no longer just enough for publishers to make articles open access. Um, and within those articles themselves, there are actually barriers to open science, whether it's uh, um, a burden on the peer review system or a um, um, not enabling uh, um, uh, the methods are not written in full, uh, the data is not available. Um, and I think this, this is, is something where publishers have to start to experiment. And I think what's uh, uh, really nice about, uh, is especially the two um, um, initiatives that we've had, is that they're collecting data on this. They're testing it at a small scale. They're willing to share the data to find out what works. There's no point publishers endorsing a policy if you then don't see if that policy has an impact. Um, and there's no point having a policy or signing up to some who, uh, World Health Organization declaration unless you can actually help authors uh, um, do that, uh, do the practices that you're, you're asking, you're signing up to yourself. Um, and so um, uh, I'm going to stop there, uh, and I want to open it to uh, the audience uh, for questions. Um, and in particular, well, there's a, there's a couple of questions. Is What's your thoughts of the roles of publishers and can publishers, uh, there are plenty of actions here today that other publishers could follow. There is absolutely no work in endorsing pub the Publish Your Reviews initiative from a publisher's perspective. The work is all on the reviewer to post their review if there's a preprint. Um, what are your thoughts on this and how do you see the role of the publisher um, evolving to start to embrace more of these practices and these evidence uh, informed uh, approach? Um, Right. Have I stopped everyone? At the back. Great. Thank you. No, who's there? If you could just say your name and where you're from. Uh, Ritu Dan, Spring in Nature. Um, three fabulous talks. Thank you very much, panel. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, one for Ian and one for Atraxia. Um, I'll start with you, Ian. I, I love the protocol initiative. Um, uh, the extraction of the, the method. Well, this is what it sounded like to me. Uh, extraction of the method um, into a protocol format. My question is, how much rewriting does the author have to do? Or do you just take whatever method is already in the paper and drop it into your protocol format. Uh, so Can you hear, Ian? No. Oh. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay. Uh, so key point is the method's never in the paper. 
we already encourage researchers to put detailed methods on protocols.io and then the format for that particular type of article is that the protocol, the method section is prepared either in advance on protocols.io or it's provided as a supporting information file and then when the article is published it's um, ensured that it's available on the protocols.io platform in that format. So there shouldn't be any rewriting. The idea is that the article is providing a peer-reviewed wrapper and context around um, the enhanced content, which is, is better served on a different platform. So I, I love that, and we, we've tried it on Nature, um, but getting the authors to do that with the paper is incredibly hard. There is very little appetite to put in the extra work to create that protocol. Did you find the same thing? Uh, so I, I think with, you know, with all new types of article and new journals, there is some activation energy that one, that one, needs, to, that one needs to put in. Um, but you know, we're already publishing this kind of research, right? We all have research papers that essentially describe a method uh, and that's considered original, an original research contribution. We actually offer this format to the researchers doing that kind of work as well. So we're now giving them choice. They can publish a more traditional methods research article or they can consider that, that format as well. Thank you. And Atraxera, your um, peer review reports on the preprint, um, love the way that it gives the, the reviewers agency with their reports. Um, and an opportunity to, to publish them where perhaps a publisher may not have that functionality. But is there a concern about taking a researchers back to perhaps an inaccurate form of the research if the eyes are on the preprint when the, the final paper is also published? Do you have any concerns about that? I think this ties to the fact that it needs to, it needs to be clear which is the version that you're reviewing. Um, and my understanding, at least for example on BioArchive, is that it will be displayed, uh, you know, when you post your review, it will be displayed on the version that it has been reviewed. Um, so I think the, the important thing as often is transparency and being clear on what is the version that is being reviewed. Um, there are a number of servers now that will also then eventually link to the journal uh, version when it appears at the journal and you can go and check the other reviews as well again as I mentioned if there is a transparent review. Um, I think it's a, a relevant item in terms of being clear what the version is etc but um, apart from the control that it gives to reviewers there is this value on the immediacy of that appraisal that evaluation being public. Uh, actually, in relation to that, and we didn't have time to add uh, uh, the discussion to the panel, is the importance of metadata, high quality metadata, um, and article uh, linking both to data, to preprints, and there's a real uh, uh, lack of that um, in the industry. And, and in fact, uh, Rory and, and Stevens, uh, uh, they've looked at that. Uh, and so there is a whole issue around the infrastructure and the metadata to support these different outputs and different forms of reviewing so that you actually, you know what you're looking at where um, Thomas had a question. Yes, uh, it's more comment than a question, no. Um, I just wanted to make three points. One very brief about the protocols. We, we have um, allowed in our papers authors to write materials and methods in the form of a protocol with bullet points and numbering. So a, a cosmetic change and we had very good feedback and the authors find that actually easier than writing blah, blah, blah text for the 10th time, how, how to make a Western blot or all these kind of things. So I think uh, we should also see that it's not obligatory additional work, but sometimes it makes things actually easier and more natural. About the peer review, I really loved uh, the, the sort of four different schools of, of peer review. And I, one, one way to see that is what is the goal of the peer review. And, and the goals should be explicit, and we were talking uh, about that yesterday evening. It can be the advancement of science, it can be more collegiality and community building, it can, it can be maybe commercial interest, why not? Uh, I think what is really important is to express very clearly and explicitly what is the goal of that kind of peer review, and then all the goals are actually valid. 
Um, one feedback, maybe, and, and Irache, you, you know about that, of course, putting the, the reviews in the public and making it transparent, we are all for that. And I, I think, you know, the core of this initiative is, is really great. I see just a, a little, uh, in my view, the, the risk of the atomization or the constructivism in, in peer review. Peer review is not just obtaining peer review reports and items or events. In my view, it's much more of a process and a civilized and managed process that needs a delicate balance. It needs a delicate balance in terms of expertise, uh, choosing uh, complementary reviews. And so a set of review is actually something that, in my view, should not be dissociated or uh, atomized. And, and one thing I think we tend to, to forget when we talk about peer review is what about the authors and what about revisions? And, and for review comments, we, we thought a long time about that. And for us, it was absolutely essential to allow the authors to reply to the reviewers. And when we, we surveyed our authors, we know now that this is the one critical step to convince the authors to put their peer review process public they really want to be able to reply to the points. And I just to, to remind that this is, you know, the, the peer review, of course, it is individual reviewers who need credit. Uh, we need to make that transparent, but I think it has to be in a process that is nicely equilibrated. I was wondering, so Aracha and then Steve. Uh, Steve yes, perhaps. very briefly. I, I agree with what Thomas is saying. I would just wanted to add a couple of things. I understand the element of uh, peer review as we, ha as we, as we understand it within the journal process, because as Stephen was mentioning, there are many different flavors that can happen and also for many different outputs. Um, within that set, you do need a set of balancing of the expertise and more than one uh, peer review potentially, etc. I, I guess what I would add to that is looking from the perspective of the individual reviewer, the reviewers, their intellectual property and their scholarship, and I think we need to put some of the control back in their hands in terms of saying, if you care about transparency and about the scientific discourse and making that publicly, you have a choice here. Again, that, that element of the choice. Um, and then from the author point of view, it is true. Um, it is true that as part of what we are encouraging here, there is no step to require the author permission because we assume that they had work that was ready to be for prime time, so with the community as a preprint on platforms that allow commenting and responding to. And the thing that I would like to highlight there is that every platform where you can post a, um, a review, etc., the authors have the option of also answering publicly. So essentially you, you level the playing field versus having this in the black box of uh, closed peer review. Uh, yeah, so um, I, 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 a number of really interesting things arising from your comments. Thank, thanks for that. I, 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 I very much agree uh, with you on a, num on a number of points. One of the things that um, our research has certainly shown, and I think you probably all know this by experience, is that because of the level of experimentation and innovation that's going on in the peer review space at the moment, I think we can basically say that this amounts to a challenge of what, what, is it is, what it is to be a peer in the peer review and what it is to review in the peer review. So all aspects of this are at play, you know, a peer, how closely does the peer reviewer have to be to the, to how close does it, do they have to be to the, to the topic? Uh, and to what extent, you know, can that stretch to say a, a, a patient expert in a, on a medical, you know, uh, so, and sometimes, you know, some editors say, actually, if they're a little bit remote from the specialism, they tend to give a better, uh, uh, overall rating uh, uh, in terms of peer review. So there are all sorts of questions around what constitutes a peer. Should they be identified by an editor? Should they be volunteers? Should they, you know, all of that kind of thing. And then there's the whole thing about what constitutes review. What, um, it, it, should it be a detailed traditional peer review addressing method or method only? Should it be rating in some kind of way? Uh, how does how does specialism relate to it, like statistical review? There are all sorts of, how does technology, how is technology involved? And is that a peer if you're involving an AI, an AI uh, which many publishers are, tool to, to carry out peer review? So that all of this is in, in play. And uh, overlaying that is what are the goals of peer review? What is it trying to do? And another thing that we're very interested in exploring as a next stage of research is talking to different actor groups and saying, what is peer review actually for? Because it's pretty clear from our research so far that 
different actors have very different views about what it's for. And peer review is trying to answer all of these different needs, and it would be interesting to unpack those across different actor groups and see whether peer review is addressing these needs, which are definitely there. So what is, what is its goal? And then very often in the four schools is, is the emphasis on what problems are we trying to fix? What's the emphasis? If it's, a, if it's an overburdened system that pushes in the direction of innovation, in the direction of streamlining and, and efficiency and creation of incentives for peer reviewers. But if it's, if it's an issue about quality and reproducibility, it pushes you in the, a very different kind of direction. And then how are those two managed in terms of the tension they create? So those are the kind of issues we're interested in exploring further. And it's a really interesting challenge, I think, uh, to get those right. And actually just collecting data, because that sort of data has not been collected before, it's not made available by publishers, researchers, or reviewers, is, is the first step to identify the problems. Uh, and a uh, context-dependent review, I think, I is a hugely important issue. And, and the fact that probably there's a large swathe of articles that just don't need traditional in-depth peer review. Um, and that's not really addressed by the industry. Do we have any more questions? Okay, so we have three minutes. Um, so <laughs> in that case, I'm going to put a final uh, one question to, e uh, to each of the panelists. So um, what would your recommendation be as a sort of first step uh, for publishers uh, to actually take action on some of the things we've been uh, talking about? What would you, you, you ideally, you know, give, give one that you can think of the most important, but uh, one or two? And I'll start, I'll start with Ian and work backwards. I think the first point is to, is, is to understand where you are now. So understand your authors, editors, and also um, what, what's actually happening in your current content. If you don't have good information, then you won't be able to take strategic action. So start collecting data on what you do yourself. And I, uh, I think that's great. Uh, I guess from my side, support transparency in peer review, and specifically, you can always do and publish your reviews. Um, but related to that, uh, another nuance is that we realize that this, um, Ian relate, mentioned activation energy, does require a, a tiny bit of activation energy from reviewers to take the extra step and post uh, the copy on the preprint. So anything that can be done in terms of automation to surface the preprint copy, for example, for the paper you have in, in your submission and surface that to the reviewer, that will, will already be a step forward. Yeah, I, I think in many cases, uh, um, reviewers are completely unaware there might be a preprint available um, of a paper. Yeah. Uh, I would say, in addition to evidence gathering, um, collaboration. Collaboration across actor groups as well as within actor groups because we can't solve these problems. One, no act, single actor can solve these kinds of problems. We need collaboration across different stakeholders to make, to make uh, solutions work. Yeah, no, and uh, uh, yes, that's a, a wonderful last point. And we saw an example of that in, in one of the earlier sessions around transparency and the sort of collaborations that uh, came out of the Plan S requirements for publishers to be more transparent about uh, pricing and cost and, and some of the metrics. And that set up a wonderful collaboration between some publishers and librarians which hadn't been there before. Um, and I think that that's of real value because no one person has the answer. Uh, and no one organization ha has, has the power to, to, to do stuff, so we do need to work together. Thank you so much, um, all of you. I look forward to uh, next year when we're talking about uh, open science publishing practices rather than just open access publishing, or just transformative deals, and how we're all beginning to connect uh, uh, these dots in, in a, real, a real meaningful way. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone.